morning. It is a blessing to see you on this wet, soggy, rainy morning. But it is a beautiful morning. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers among us. Let me say that when I say Happy Mother's Day, I not only mean Happy Mother's Day to women who have had biological children, but also to women who are spiritual mothers to us all. Happy Mother's Day to all of the women among us this morning. I have a few quick announcements before we begin our service this morning. First, you will notice that there is a binder on each of your aisles. Please take this, fill this out, share this with a neighbor sitting beside you. Next, I want to thank everyone who brought their favorite potluck dish last Wednesday night and their favorite dessert. Wow, they were delicious. And what was most amazing last Wednesday night is the children's drama team reenacting the parable of, uh, you know, the, the, the lost son, um, the parable of the prodigal child. What was interesting is I walked into the room right when children had put on the pig snouts and they were acting at the pig. And I'm the one in the back of the room that when they were doing their ovation, I yelled, yay for the, the pigs and the snouts. And yeah, that was me. What a wonderful job our children did in putting that on and teaching us. Amen. Just evidence of the beginning of a new era of drama ministry here at Fellowship, and I want to thank Betsy for all that she does in helping to make that happen and become a reality. Now, the Wednesday upcoming, now we're going to have Wednesday evening dinners throughout the summer. And those will be determined. They're just going to be fellowship evenings. There may be 10 of us here. There may be 20 of us here. That's okay. Tammy Raspberry and Jill Billiken are going to be planning those. They're each going to be potluck themed. But this coming Wednesday night, we are going to meet, and it's going to be a tailgate party. This means deviled eggs are fair game, and anything wrapped in bacon is fair game. (laughs) Fix your favorite tailgate food. Bring it to the church, and if you want to feel really adventurous, wear your team's favorite jersey. Uh, We're going to see how many Cowboys fans we have and how many Kansas City fans we have, okay? Wear your favorite team jersey, and let's just have some fun on Wednesday evening. Sunday coming up is going to be Pentecost Sunday. This is a celebration in the life of the church, one of the oldest known holidays in the world. We're going to celebrate the birth of the church through the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And we're going to celebrate on this special day our confirmands being confirmed into the life of the church. So I want you to come and be part of that. I want you to also sign up to give blood. We're going to give blood next Sunday. Each donation saves about three lives. So Carter Blood Care will have their blood mobile right here in the parking lot. Next Sunday after that is May the 26th, is Senior Graduation Sunday. And that Sunday we're going to honor our graduating high school seniors and college seniors. If you have a senior, please communicate with Tyler Sweat. And you can get a hold of him at Tyler at FUMCTC.com and tell him all the information about your graduating senior so that he can include that. Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. Doesn't seem like it's that time already, but it is. June 3rd through 6th, we've got many children signed up, and we have needs. We have a need for a second and third grade teacher. So if you feel God calling you to teach... You know that voice that you've been ignoring, like, please be the second and third grade teacher? I want to encourage you to sign up and see Miss Betsy in the back. She will be glad to point you in the right direction. And then happy Mother's Day to all of our women. We celebrate you and we celebrate your influence in our lives. And I will say this later, but I'll say it now as well. There would not be a Christian church today if it were not for the women that formed it and kept it going. Thank you. So my friends, I invite you as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship to stand and join me in our call to worship.
I tell you this, it is a wonderful thing when members of the family live together in love and peace. They shall be like trees planted beside flowing rivers. May the church be one, just as Christ and God are one, that Christ may be glorified in us. They shall yield good fruit in its season, and their leaf shall never wither. The grace, mercy, and peace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. So my friends, it is my delight to introduce you, if you weren't here last Sunday, to our new Director of Music and Worship here at Fellowship United Methodist Church. Mr. Jason Chavarria, would you come and tell us what we're going to be singing together? It is a delight to be here. Thank you for the way you welcomed me as I started just last week. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our praise now with our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord Almighty. Church family, please lend me your ears as we listen to the spiritual counsels of Psalm 1. The truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice, doesn't stand on the road of sinners, and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. Instead of doing those things, these persons love the Lord's instruction and they recite God's instruction day and night. They are like a tree replanted by streams of water, which bears fruit at just the right time, and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do succeeds. That's not true for the wicked. They are like dust that the wind blows away. And that's why the wicked will have no standing in the court of justice, neither will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. 
The Lord is intimately acquainted with the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is destroyed. Now will you please stand and join me as we affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing the Gloria Patri. kinds of messages up here. Somebody left a large print hymnal for me. <laughs> but it doesn't have any notes in it. So, but I thank you for that. And also, I uh, want to mention that there will be no Bible class tonight because all the mothers, for some reason, want to be with their families today. And I also want to thank Bill and Casey for Legally Blonde Jr., it was wonderful. If you didn't get a chance to see it, I'm sorry, because I think it's over, right? Did you all were right. It's awfully nice to have such talent with us in our choir. But it's time, my friends, to go together to the Lord in prayer. Will you join with me, please? O oh, Eternal and Holy One, we come to worship you today with gratitude and awe. We are grateful that we can be with you and that you care enough about your children that we can worship with you. So Lord, as always, we thank you for loving us. We may often seem to ignore you and we may not always recognize how you consistently care for all of your creation, but we do know you are always with us. Our scripture today comes from the last prayer of Jesus with his disciples just before his betrayal and destruction. John's gospel records these moments as if he were a reporter. But Jesus' prayer conveys Jesus' turmoil that night. He will miss his friends. Those disciples are our predecessors in the faith. So John paints Jesus as a nurturer. He tends to the disciples and to all of us believers. This Mother's Day, we are thinking of the nurturing role played in many of our families and in many of the close relationships in our lives. These are people who help us as we grow into and live lives that will lead other children of God toward God's kingdom. So we pray to you for these people who have helped build us up. We thank you, O oh God, for your gifts which abound and at times overwhelm us with the weight of their love. How often, O oh Lord, we have come to you with our empty cups, cups that have been poured out to others, and yet you fill those cups to the brim, overflowing them with compassion, renewed strength, continuous courage, healthy hope, and the will to go on in our living of the faith. Forgive us, Holy One, for our faltering faith. So often we fear that by releasing some of our resources, we might jeopardize our future. 
Help us not to be such captives of the obsession for security that we forget to trust you, the great giver of all our gifts. Help us remember that, though we do not always receive what we want, you have consistently and continually supplied what we need. Again, for that bounty, we are thoroughly grateful. We celebrate the joy you place in our hearts as we offer help to others through the divine act of giving a cup of cool water to those that thirst. And Holy One, remind us of those people in our lives that have nurtured us, given us literal or a figurative cup of water that leads to aid us, offering hope for our own lives. These are our prayers today, Holy Other. We offer them to you by praying the prayer Jesus taught us when he was with us so long ago, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, Thank you, Bob. My friends, I want to invite you to respond to God's love and God's grace in your life through our generosity. You know, a very Methodist thing to do. Someone asked John Wesley one time, did we think that we as Methodists were going to be saved because of our good works? And he replied, no, it is because we are saved that we do these good works. These good works are evidence of our salvation. So my friends, let us live into that. There are a few ways that you can support the building of God's kingdom here and now. The first, there is a new shopping list for May in your bulletins when you're at the supermarket. Even if you're breathing H-E-B, now you know what I'm talking about because it takes sometimes an act of Congress to get down the aisle. Once you're there, instead of one package of ketchup, instead of one mustard, grab several, bring them to the church, and place them in the red wagon outside. We're making deliveries each and every week. I then want to invite you to be generous with your financial support. April was not a good month for us. April was a struggle. We usually have that month sometime. It's either April, it's July, or it's September. This year it hit us with April, and we're now coming from a place of deficit. We want to overcome this deficit in the rest of May and June to let us have some of those leaner months later in the summer in which people are traveling. So, my friends, we need your help and we need your generosity. There are several ways that you can give and support the building of God's kingdom here. You may mail your gift to the church. You may make an electronic funds transfer at fumctc.com. Just click on the giving tab. You may use Venmo. The QR code is right there on the screen. Or you may drop off your gift in any of the offering plates as they're passed around. But may God bless this offering that we freely give this morning. May God use it, multiply it to feed a hungry world to soothe the hurts of people in need. And the people of God said, Amen.
seated, and I'd like to invite our younger ones, our children between pre-K and the second grade. We have a custom worship experience designed just for you. Feel free to meet Miss Betsy at the back of the sanctuary. For the rest of us, my friends, I, I have a couple of thank yous to make. And please withhold your applause until the very end, or we'd be here for a little while. I want to thank Terry and Jenny for that beautiful job. Thank you for being who you are. Well, hold, on, hold on a minute. Hold on. We've got several to get through here. Hold on. Thank you for Jackson. Beautiful job. And we love our choral scholars. For Jason, thank you for singing with the choir and for loving them. And for our choir, amazing job. Thank you for who you are. It's a blessing to us, and we appreciate you. So happy Mother's Day. That's a joyous thing. It's okay. Let's do a little something. Let's, you, you say it back. You, happy Mother's Day. Yes. This is a day for us to celebrate and honor women in our lives. And on one side of the coin, it's a day of celebration. We're honoring women. We're honoring women that have given birth to children who are biological mothers, but we're also honoring women that have been spiritual mothers to us all who may not have had children of their own. Women who have been an influence in our lives, we honor you. But while there's joy to be felt, there is also this day pain to be felt. Look around for just a moment. Find the mothers among us that are absent. Maybe mothers who are struggling because their spouses have passed away. Maybe mothers who are struggling because their children aren't speaking to them. Maybe mothers who have lost their children. What about mothers that may not have had wonderful mothers growing up? There are two Sundays that I always struggle with in the Christian year to preach a sermon. Mother's Day and Father's Day. Because Mother's Day and Father's Day are not always happy days for me because I did not have that nurturing influence in my life. In fact, it was anything but. So I struggle with that. I struggle with that. I also see the opposite side of the coin on Mother's Day. Because some women may be upset, or some men may be upset at the influence of their mothers in their lives. Consider this. Let's say a woman was battered and abused by her father. What do you think she thinks of when we say, our father who art in heaven? Does that not act as a trigger to some people? To some it does. I think it's important for us to recognize that. I think it's important for us to recognize that how we speak about God is vitally important in this world. How we talk about God is important. How we live pointing toward God is important. What we say about God is important. People will judge God based upon what they see in us. While we can understand, a person may be triggered by our Father who art in heaven. Just on the same side, is it also okay for us to say God has motherly qualities? The psalm says that God is like a mother hen taking her chicks under her wing to protect her. Is it okay for us to see that God exists beyond gender? yet includes the very ultimate of what a father and mother could be. 
It gives me hope because I struggle with that influence in my life that God overcomes my meager definitions of what a father or mother are. Today, I want us to look and continue our journey of how the Holy Spirit, how God works within our lives. And last week, we looked at how the Holy Spirit works in love in our lives, shaping us. This week, we're going to look at nurturing. Now, what does it mean to nurture? If you look up nurturing in the dictionary and how we use that term, you're going to find at least five or six different meanings. On the one hand, nurturing means to feed and to protect somebody. We nurture our children going up in our families by feeding them and protecting them. Nurture also means to support and encourage. Our teachers at our schools do a wonderful job with this. Nurturing also means to bring up in our families and to educate. Nurturing also means to raise and train. And nurturing also means to develop. Aren't those all qualities within nurturing that God does in our lives every day, every moment? How does God nurture? I was talking about this idea this morning of God being beyond gender, but yet the ultimate fulfillment of what it means to be father and mother. And in the nine o'clock worship service, the computer at the, at the AV booth is a Mac that has Siri. But the Mac is hooked into the soundboard. And all we heard, and I was talking about God being other having this, these qualities of nurturing and how we have to get beyond the world's definitions and the world's skewed understanding of just Father and understanding how God loves and births into the world. And it was that moment that Siri came over the speakers. Hi, how may I help you today? <laughs> and, and everybody stopped. And half the room was laughing and pointing at their iPhone saying it's Siri. The other half of the room looked up. It's like, yes! Yes, they looked up. I started to have a, have a fun with them. I was like, yes, God. But sometimes we struggle with thinking about God in those feminine nurturing ways. So how does God nurture us? How does Jesus nurture us? Well, our lectionary scripture today takes us on a journey in which Jesus is spending his last moments with his disciples, preparing him for a life without him. Just shortly before his arrest, shortly before his beating, his his crucifixion, and his being placed into a tomb. And Jesus begins to pray to God for his disciples in their very presence. Here's what Jesus said. In this prayer from John chapter 17, beginning in verse 6. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except for the one destined to be lost. So I that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. 
I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I know it gets a little wordy, right? It gets a little wordy. Someone sent me a meme one time that, that said, what if our relationships were based in how we pray? I, I grew up in, a, in a, a tradition that my father had the same prayer memorized and we got the same prayer every mealtime. And it always started with, Holy Father, Lord and God, and it just went on. It was the same thing. Okay, what if we treated each other that same way? Hi, Gail. How you doing, Gail? Holy Gail. Gail, can I? Gail, it just okay. Think about what we're saying here. I just surprised Gail, but but think about you know, Emily, Emily, Emily. Can I? Emily, can you? You see what I'm saying? What we speak matters. Now, this gets a little wordy, and it gets a little wordy. Let's dig down into the words and get to what Jesus is really talking about, okay? Jesus is nurturing his disciples, praying to God on their behalf. There is not a day that doesn't go by that I don't start my day and end my day praying for every one of you. Jesus is praying for his disciples, praying for them, praying that they're going to be one. Didn't you love that in the scripture? I pray that they are one, just as we are one. So Jesus nurtures these disciples first by praying for their relationship, that they may be one together. Let me ask you this. Where would you be without the church today? Where would you be without relationship? Where would you be without love? You know, we are a varied, varied people on Sunday mornings. We come from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different socioeconomic statuses, different experiences. Each one of us has a complete different understanding of life. And there are some among us that choose not to eat bacon. I know. I respect that. Where would we be without the relationship of one another surrounding us? Where would we be without the nurturing of that? We don't all get along all the time. We go through ups and downs. We don't always believe the same thing. But you know what? We love our family of faith. Amen? Secondly, Jesus nurtures these disciples through praying for God's protection over them. Has your parents paid, prayed for God's protection over you? Have you prayed for your children? I do this constantly. You know, I, I've had this weird thought, and people told me, well, this children are a big commitment. For about 18 years. <laughs> Parents, it's a big commitment for the rest of your life. It doesn't end. I know as I've had two adult children out of three that have come back and are living at home right now. I still pray for them. One, working deep night shift. I pray that he gets to work okay. I pray that he comes home okay. I pray for him. Some of you who grew up in my era, you know your, your, your parents talked to you before you left the house. Drive on the right side of the road. Don't drink and drive. If a, nor if a tornado comes, what do you do? Pull over and get in the ditch. Wear clean. Yeah, you've heard that. 
What's the thing that's not going to be clean if you're in an accident? I never understood that from my parents. It's like, why do you say that? But what I've come to realize later on in my life is that those were just the words to tell us to get us out the door to make themselves feel comfortable with saying goodbye when they're actually praying for you, praying for your protection. None of us want to see our children hurt. And there is nothing that thrills my heart more than to see the family come together and say, a child is hurting, we're going to take care of that child, we're going to love that child, we're going to pray for that child. I remember just a few months ago when we as a family of faith were praying for Jay Lee. We prayed and we rejoiced. Everything is going to be good. That's what families do. We nurture one another through praying for our protection. And we nurture each other through empowerment. We empower one another. Why? Because it's not just one of us up here. It's not just two of us up here. It's all of us up here. Were you not moved by the choir a few minutes ago? Someone asked me, I want to join a Bible study. What Bible study can I join? I said, join the choir. You guys read more scripture in the hymns than most of us do. Join the choir. But we believe in empowering one another. And I love that we're part of a church that believes in the empowerment of women. I'm going to say this again. I do not believe that there would be a Christian church without women. Because there are times, if you look back into our early Methodist history, not only was Mary Magdalene the first woman that Jesus sent to proclaim the gospel message to the disciples, but you look at women all throughout history connected to the church and even in the early Methodist history. It's said that early circuit rider Peter Cartwright would ride to different churches and he would stop at churches and he would be met with a whole group of congregation that were all women. And he would ask them, where are your husbands? And they would say, at the saloon. So he would ride his horse to the saloon, walk in, lock the door, hand his gun, it's the Wild West days, to the saloon keeper and start calling men by name and saying, you're coming to church with me right now. And I'll drag you out here if I have to. Imagine that. It was the women keeping the church going. It was women in churches that I serve that said, oh, this is a popcorn church. What does that mean? Because they wanted to build a church during the Great Depression. And they had no funds. And they would go out on the sidewalks and sell popcorn. Popcorn. For pennies a bag. And that's what they used to support the building of their church. Yet there are some denominations this day that would say that women are not able or fit to lead us in worship. I thought about that this morning. I thought, you know, I really need a woman to preach this morning. I called all my friends. All my colleagues who are women, and they all told me, yeah, it's Mother's Day. We're not doing that. We're taking the Sunday off. The first person I called was Reverend Liz. Reverend Liz, guess what? You're going to preach. And she's like, no, I'm taking the Sunday off. So then I have to be the voice to say that we love you. And your voice is important to us. You are important to us. And we would not be a church without you. Thank you for who you are. And happy Mother's Day. As we said earlier, happy Mother's Day can be painful for some. It was for me. Growing up, I didn't understand what nurturing really was or meant. And I'll be honest with you, it wasn't until I, I was an adult. Oh, I found myself in law enforcement. That's an easy, that's an easy career to not be nurturing. 
walls. You can put up walls. You can walk up to a car. Do you know why I pulled you over today? And Reverend Bob would say, no. But I stopped at that stop sign. No, you didn't. But I didn't know what it was like to be nurturing. And what I realized is I am not a very nurturing person. But I've learned with women involved in my life, people that I never knew that would bless me became nurturing figures in my life and who taught me how to nurture. One of the biggest lessons that I had to learn in seminary, and I, I want to applaud Jason and Tyler for completing their first year of seminary with honors, both of them. We, congratulations. <laughs> but when I was where they are, I was looking at the fall schedule, and I was trying to plan my schedule. And I had this hole in my schedule. Now, I was, I was pastoring three United Methodist churches as their lead pastor out in the country. I was taking 12 semester hours at a time. And I was trying to keep from having to drive the 60-mile one-way commute each way. I only wanted to do it twice a week, not four times a week. And I had this hole in my schedule. And I couldn't fit anything in that hole but one person and one class. And I said, I am not going to take that person and I'm not going to take that class because I've got triggers. I've got trauma from my past. And that person is a Baptist. I'm not going to take that person because they're a Baptist. I didn't understand the difference in Baptists I love Baptists, okay? Don't get me wrong. Finally, I said, I can make do with anything for a short period of time. I went to that first class, and I remember kicking and screaming all the way. I didn't like the Gospel of John. I didn't like it. And that professor was not going to teach me anything. And that professor became one of the most important voices, a woman's voice in my life that's ever been. And I owe what I am today to Reverend Dr. Jamie Clark Souls and also to Reverend Dr. Alice McKenzie, who shaped me. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here growing up in an abusive home being told that I can't be a pastor, that I don't have the skills to be a pastor, that I'll never be able to speak in front of people, constantly being beaten down. It was a church member when I was an adult that says, I see something in you. And she was the lay leader of our church. And I said, but I can't be a pastor. And she goes, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. What I love about fellowship is that we're a nurturing congregation. Nurturing one another in God's love because God's love is nurturing us. The Holy Spirit is nurturing us, growing us into a more perfect image in which we are created. The Holy Spirit, we're going to celebrate Sunday, is birthing the church into existence even in these dark days. And I'm telling you, the world outside these doors, even within these doors at times, is so divided, so prone to extremes, so prone to violence. And yet, the Holy Spirit is birthing church in new ways. Don't we need more nurturing in this world? I want us to reflect on this scripture throughout the week and remember the lessons of Mother's Day. May we be inspired by the nurturing love of Jesus Christ.
who prayed for his disciples with tenderness and with compassion. Let us honor the mothers and the motherly figures in our lives whose love mirrors the unconditional love of God. And may we in turn embody that same nurturing love in our relationships, in our protecting, in our empowering, and guiding one another as we journey together in faith and love. My friends, we need more nurturing in our world. Let us all, all of us, men especially, learn the nurturing from the women among us and be more nurturing to the world. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, as we come to you in these holy and sacred moments of worship, we struggle with the world around us. We struggle with a lack of nurturing. We struggle with preconceived ideas and notions. We struggle with racism and prejudice. We struggle with hatred and violence. We struggle with war. We struggle with the need to divide. The very words that we say, the very actions that we have, speak to you. Help us to be faithful when we speak of you. Help our actions and our beliefs and our words bring glory and honor to you. Help us to be more nurturing to the world around us, more nurturing to our brothers and sisters, even more nurturing to ourselves as you nurture us within our spirits. Remind us, God, that as we leave this place today, that we may be the only Bible some people will ever read. Help us to have a great message. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we close our worship service this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able and let us sing our final hymn, The Gift of Love. to our AV team, let's hold right here. Let's go back to, to the last slide. Let inward love guide every deed. By this we worship and are freed. Take a moment to memorize these words. Let it be our anthem in the week to come.
My friends, you may have a question, something that was provoked here today. It may be a question about your journey of faith. It may be, how do I join this church in the United Methodist Church? And your pastors, we invite you to that conversation because we walk this journey as a family. Let's talk. My friends, as we leave from this place today, church is not just what we do or who we are on a Sunday morning. Church is who we are on Tuesday through Saturday, even in the twilight of Saturday evening. We are the church. And so many people have lost faith. Faith in love, faith in God, faith in the church. Go and help people fall in love with God again. Go and help these words on the screen become the mantras of our heart. Let inward love guide every deed that we have. And by this we worship and are freed. Go. Again, you may be the only Bible some people read this week. Preach loud and preach strong. And the people of God said, Amen. Thank you.